recording. Welcome to the Long Beach City College Political Action Coalition interviews of Board of Trustee Candidates for the Long Beach Community College District. This coalition consists of representation from the full-time faculty political action committee, the part-time faculty union, and the classified staff union. You will be given one hour to answer our 15 questions. Let us begin with introductions. My name is Janae Hunt. I am the full-time faculty political action committee chair and sociology professor. I'm Katherine Jennings and I am the PAC liaison and I am full-time in reading. Okay, I'm Jonathan Ekman. I'm the LAC campus representative for AFT. Susan Trask. I'm um, AFT communications uh, representative. Thomas Hamilton. I'm an AFT president of classified employees. Carol Sable, part-time union faculty member of math department. Jennifer Downs, vice chair of the PAC and the teaching And I'll start. Uh, Mr. Slaughter, explain three tangible improvements that you would like to see at Long Beach City College. Okay. Uh, let me first start by saying that I thank the Long Beach City College Political Action Coalition for inviting me for this interview for the Board of Trustees uh, District Number 5. Uh, this powerful coalition, uh, the Long Beach City College Community College Association, the Long Beach City College Certified Honorary Instructors, and the Long Beach City College American Federation of Teachers represent 308 full-time faculty, 639 adjunct faculty, and 428 classified employees, and the three representatives from each of those employee groups. Uh, together we can change the, the dynamics of this college and this community. And with your question, the three things that I would do first is one, work to restore trust from the Board of Trustees to all of the major constituents in this community. One, the community, two, the faculty, two, the adjunct faculty, three, the classified staff, and four, the students. That trust has been noticeably missing over the past several years, not year, years. Second, I would work to change the budget reallocations that we currently have. Uh, there's a trend now and I faced it when I taught as an adjunct faculty at Santa Monica City College of eliminating the vocational programs and then change that institution into a two-year transfer institution. We are on the road to following that same model. When I was at Santa Monica City College, I lost my job because of that. So I have a particular ax to bear on that. I do not wish to see it here. We have a mission here. And the mission since 1927 has been to have transfer classes and vocational classes for the community. I am a veteran from the military. And when I uh, was released from active duty under honorable conditions, my first step when I came back home was to enlist in a local community college, which led to me getting my bachelor's degree and later my master's degree. And third, I am definitely going to be able to, to curtail our bloated administrative bureaucracy. And I've got some prime examples that I can give you on that. Uh, one of the figures that I want to show you is that if you take a look at our 26 administrators that we have here at Long Beach City College and you average out their salaries, benefits, and other perks that are thrown into the package. The average administrator has a salary package of $175,000 uh, across the board. Whereas if you take a look at the 308 full-time faculty here at Long Beach City College and you divide it into the same pot, we have an average of approximately $100,000 uh, $24,000. I'm sorry, $124,000 and $873. The difference between this is $50,000. And then you lavish the uh, perks in there. Uh, most of you, uh, all employees at this college, pay 77% 70, of your salaries into your pension plan. 
Our current board, of members of the Board of Trustees, have granted our president and superintendent a bonus tax-free prepaid retirement of $21,130 a year. I would think that someone that makes $264,000 a year and gets $18,000 in personal reimbursements a year for all kind of perks can pay 7% of his salary into the state retirement system. So I would definitely be a vote to curtail the, the bureaucracy. Now on average, we have to take a, take a look at our classified staff also. The average salary among all of our employees, uh, bringing in the adjunct faculty, bringing in the classified staff, is only $26,000 a year. Each of those uh, employees in each of those groups pay into the retirement system. There should be some fairness here, my number one go. Restore public trust, restore fairness. And also, I'll throw in a fourth, since I have a strong law enforcement background and I had some concerns that I faced when I was in the classrooms and some incidents I saw on this campus, also make sure we have a strong public safety uh, campus. And that's a, something I'll bring up at the end on my thoughts on that. So hopefully that answers question number one, the three improvements with the fourth one thrown in that you will say me as a vote from District 5 on the Board of Trustees. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. In the past, the Western Association of Schools and Scholars and Accreditation Commission for Community and Junior College team found a lack of communication and collaboration between the administration and the faculty at LBCC. Recently, the CCA president has stated that morale at LBC is at an all-time low. How might this situation be improved, and what is the role of the Board of Trustees to bring about this change? Unfortunately, our current Board of Trustees, with the exception of one member, has turned into to a, let's use the quote, old oh boy cronyism system. That's why we have a bloated administrative bureaucracy at this college. At Long Beach City College, we have averaged nine vice presidents in the administration. Whereas you look at all of the surrounding community colleges around us, they average only three vice presidents. What work are these other vice presidents doing that's been accomplished by three that we have to have nine? It shows we have a bloated staff and we have to take a look at what's being done here. And it's done by, because the uh, current members of the Board of Trustees, uh, whose uh, job is to uh, make and direct policy, which is carried out by our superintendent slash president, have given up that primary function and turn it over to the president where they turn it into a yes system. Uh, one of the things that we could take a look at to restore and trust is this week in the current issue of the Viking uh, newspaper, there was an interesting article and something that many of us noted uh, years ago is that the current Vice President of Student Affairs has resigned his office and has moved on. Now we know from his background that when he was at Modesto Community College, he was brought in to cut the throats of the faculty and the staff. And he did a very successful job of that. And he never should have moved on to another job because of his controversial background, which include, if you look at his website, uh, lyrics that are offensive to all segments of our society, particularly women. A person with that background never should have been here but he was bought in to do what? Cut the throats of our faculty, our staff, here at Long Beach City College, which he did, and it cost, we paid him like $175,000 to do that, to have our throats cut, and then he moves on to his next job. That is a lack of trust, and if I was a current member of the faculty, if I was a current member of the staff, I wouldn't trust the administration to be dealing with me on a fair basis. So when we look at future contract negotiations, we have to be fair. We have to be able to show up front what our pot is because we all know that we are in troubled times in the state of California and most of our money comes from the state apportionment money, FTEs, right? 
and our FTEs have been reduced. They've gone up a couple of hundred this year for the new fiscal year, but we're still below where we used to be in the past. Uh, we have to be honest and say, this is our pot, and then we have a fair division. Now, for our current superintendent to receive continual high praises and automatic 4% bonuses where we, or you as employees, will receive zero in the cost of living uh, uh, improvements for the next uh, year. Something's wrong with that picture. Everyone should suffer. We suffer together, we stand together, we bend together in tough times, and when good times come, we all share together. But it's just the reverse of the current system that we have here now. <clears throat> The majority of community college students need remediation. Recent actions have shifted the focus of LBCCD to a transfer institution. What do you think about this shift? Well, I think I made it pretty clear earlier that I was a victim of, of the uh, shift to a uh, Bacon Santa Monica City College, a transfer institution into UCLA. I oppose it again. I oppose it and I will fight it. Now it takes three members on the, on the Board of Trustees to direct and change policy. With two members on the Board of Trustees, you can force policy discussions. One member cannot do it by himself, but two members, you have a second, and that can bring up policy discussions before they're voted down. But if we only have two members on the Board of Trustees after this next election, on April 8th, 2014, then we can prepare for two years down the road with the policy discussions being public uh, in the press and to the public to change the dynamics to get that third vote four years from now. now hopefully we get the, the two extra votes in 2014. And that's why you have this powerful coalition together that you wish to change the dynamics of this. And I'm pretty, hopefully we'll be successful. But if not, you at least have two and you will have the policy discussions, and then it will force those that are the wise on the fence to come over to our side. So I'm against the transfer institution into California State University, Long Beach, which there seems to be a trend to doing that right now. <coughs> What would you do to enhance LBCCD's ability to provide quality jobs for its employees, which in turn leads to a stronger economy? Okay. <coughs> Our vocational programs here at Long Beach City College has been gutted. If you take a look at our current college catalog, our classes have, and courses and programs have been gutted over the past five years, particularly the program that I taught in, the uh, Administration of Justice. Five years ago, our program was gutted at the firearms program. To be a successful police officer in the state of California, and every single department requires their employees to be firearms proficient, they have to be familiar with the use of firearms. We have a program where that one third of our program is entirely missing. The same thing is apparent in our fire program. In our fire program, we have no equipment at this college that we can call on as our own to train our employees in that program. Also, if we take a look at the recent move to gut out the entire health and human services program, uh, it was right in front of us, but it was spared at the very last minute. But the acts fell on 11 vocational programs, which had gutted it. You know, we have four major airports in this area, and we gutted our aviation maintenance program. And we have something like 20 regional airports in this area. Guaranteed jobs in our welding program. We have a built a state-of-the-art facility and only one of seven programs in the entire state, and our program was considered the best, we gutted it. And the rumors now is that we have empty space, we'll lease it to maybe the Port of Long Beach. 
not for the benefit of our students, to have great paying career jobs down the road. So our gutted programs were in the auto body section, aviation maintenance, audio production, interior design, our welding program that I just referred to, our auto mechanics program, which we all need, our real estate program, photography program, air conditioning and refrigeration program, which we are all are facing now and if our air conditioning goes out, which is big business in Southern California. Our diesel mechanics program, we're at the port of Long Beach, all of the trucks there are diesel, they need mechanics. These are all jobs that we're waiting for our people to get the certificates or to get the courses that will qualify them for these fine outstanding jobs. And last of all, our carpentry program. So uh, we have cut out a pro our quality programs which had guaranteed job openings in a quest to change the mission of this institution. It's wrong and we have to change it. Number five, please discuss your understanding of the LBCCD budget and budget reserves. What should be the top priorities for budget allocation? What experience do you have with budgeting, auditing, and or accountability? Okay, let's start with the, uh, uh, the background for budgeting. Uh, prior to my coming to Long Beach City College, and even when I was working here for a short period of time, I was the chairperson and a board member of the Santa Monica City Employees Credit Union, which is now part of Southland Credit Union. Uh, the credit union is a $200 million financial institution. I am well aware of the, uh, what it takes to run such an institution, the reports that come by, what we need for auditing processes, and everything associated with that. So understanding budgets is part of my background through that training that I had and that experience I had for over six years, being chair and vice chair and board member of the credit union. Also, I have previous experience uh, serving in the past in one of our uh, close to nearby cities as a mayor and elected city council member for the city. We dealt with budgets. The primary function of any city council is budget issues and making the hard decisions on when to say yes and when to say no. And sometimes you have to say no. So uh, the priorities for our budget that we're looking at at uh, Long Beach City College is one, we have to shift the focus uh, and restore our cut vocational programs. Now, we look, now, I think everyone is well aware that we cannot probably bring back all of the original programs, but we, we can bring them back in a modified manner because two of our outstanding professors out of the 11 that we lost have already submitted their retirements. So they won't be back. So that experience, that long time experience is now lost to the college. And so we'll have some revised programs, but the shift of changing us into a two-year transfer institution can be changed with three votes on the uh, Board of Trustees. And it can be far more difficult with two votes on the Board of Trustees uh, when this discussions become public. Uh, I think everyone is well aware that 85% uh, of our $102 million salary, uh, $102 million budget is for salaries and benefits for our employees and that covers the entire full range of employees from administrators uh, down to our classified employees and adjunct faculty. Uh, my goal is this, and I said it before, if you have a limited pot of money and we have had reductions under Proposition 98 and some restoration under Proposition 30, but not what we expect it really to be, it's still less, we have to be fair and open to the employees and be fair in negotiations. And I hope, and I will say this, uh, I have a background and I will be a fair negotiator. I had to negotiate employee contracts with the employees of the credit union. 
I had to be a fair negotiator uh, when we directed negotiations uh, as a mayor and city council member. Although Prop 30 would serve to restore some monies to the community college system, recent trends have defended public education in general and simultaneously open the doors to privatization. What are your thoughts about these trends? Okay. Now, uh, everyone has a clear understanding of Proposition 30. Proposition 30 restored some of the money that we lost when the state deferred payment uh, of some $961 million to our community college districts in the state of California. Uh, that uh, has been reduced now to some $561 million, but we're still $561 million in the hole that, we, that none of the college districts will more than likely ever receive back in total. Under Proposition uh, 30, the reduced ref deferrals from the state of California for Long Beach City College is minor since we rely so heavily on the state general apportionments, our FTEs. Uh, the three triads for uh, funding for our college district are the FTEs, uh, property taxes, and student fees. Student fees have been raised, but it's still not enough to bring us back to where we were in our glory days with the money. Uh, we were looking at under Proposition 30 in the 2012-2013 budget to receive some $25 million uh, in Proposition 30 money. But the uh, state legislative office indicated that this was probably 10% too high uh, <clears throat> of those estimates. So we're not going to receive $25 million. We're going to receive far less. In fact, they said we're only going to receive like 39% of that money. So our district has had to re rely primarily on short-term borrowing of money, which has high interest rates, which when we do this, it takes away money from the pot that we can use to build this institution and improve the uh, pay packages and uh, of our employees. So as a result of all of this massive short-term borrowing, uh, we're, we're still in some difficult situations. Uh, now, I am definitely against privatizing our jobs. We have here at Long Beach City College a new term. It's called the 45 percenter. That's for our classified staff. Classified staff that should be working 12 uh, months a year are working 10 months a year. And we have our new term. And they accepted that to save the jobs of as many of their employees as possible. And many, particularly as adjunct faculties, when the classes are cut, adjunct faculty goes first. And one of the things, in fairness to all, is that when adjunct faculty are cut, full-time instructors shouldn't be taking over little classes, uh, making more money when their fellow employee is being sacrificed on the side. So we have to take a look at all of these issues involved in this and um, and be fair all the way around and look at how we do things in-house uh, for each department and our programs and also um, how we will uh, balance our, our current problems out in the future. So it's discussion, that's why we have shared governance, which I know is a question coming down the road but everyone will get to put their opinion in and, and hopefully uh, the opinions uh, are honestly accepted and discussed by everybody before uh, hard decisions are made. Number seven, since July 2010, President Oakley has been awarded a 4% annual pay increase as well as, quote, reasonable expenses, end quote, including moving expenses, 2,500 mileage uh, per month and 8% STRS contributions. In that time period, over 200 staff have experienced reductions in force, 11 vocational programs have been discontinued, and 13 faculty have experienced reduction in force. LBCCD awarded a $20,000 pay increase 
to the executive vice president in fall 2012. Similarly, while the number of faculty, staff, and students, FTES, full-time equivalent student, has declined since 2005, the number of administrators has risen. What is your stance with regards to the discrepancy between administrative increases and classroom, staff, and faculty reductions? What would you do to ensure that monies are restored into the classroom and administrative costs are reduced? The uh, board, three members of the Board of Trustees decides the contract for our superintendent and president. Every year, uh, our president makes an announcement and that my contract has been reapproved, and that's good for him. And if I was him, I would grab all of those perks and run with them. <laughs> but on the other hand, a person in his posi position should be aware that it doesn't look good if you're cutting your employees, you're slashing their salaries, you're reducing their programs, and then you're taking huge pay raises, and his pay raises are huge in the economy that we have today. Now, when I taught here as a professor of administration of justice, I was the advisor for the American Criminal Justice Association uh, Club, the Sigma Pi uh, Criminal Justice Club here on campus. And we had two major events that we traveled to each year, a regional conference and a national conference. And our program, when I was here, uh, won the highest honors in the national uh, organization. But when I traveled uh, with my students and we fundraised all year to raise money, I, out of my own pocket, paid for my own hotel room in the different cities so we would have more money for our students and we could take more students. And also, many of the meals that we had I paid for it on my own. And because uh, many of our students uh, uh, were sometimes short of money, my wife and I would also uh, have uh, one major meal where we invited all of our students uh, that went with us that we paid for the entire meal. Our president, with some of these lavish perks, if he was wise and he sees the changing trend coming, and I can assure you that the change is coming, should start reducing some of those perks and come out with a phrase, I am now one of you. We haven't heard that. Mr. President, if you hear me, you haven't said it yet and you haven't understood the position and the mistrust and the lack of morale that you've caused to everyone else here. Change is coming. We will make changes in that. I say it takes three votes. Two votes can make the contract public. Of course, you have to have a second. Three votes can change the contract or not renew the contract. Now, as for uh, our bloated bureaucracy that we have with administration staff, I mentioned earlier, why do we have nine vice presidents and now it's down to eight because not one has retired and all of the surrounding colleges around us can do the same work, same job with three. There needs to be some consolidation and um, that will be one of our uh, pet projects uh, down the road to do so. Um, now, each of us should have a voice in this, including our students. We need to make the changes. We need to turn around on the ship that we're on now that is sinking and re uh, restore some buoyancy to the ship. So, uh, There was something in here I wanted to say. Oh, okay. Um, the uh, uh, restoration of our uh, cancel programs, not all of them come back, can come back. Um, it would cost us a fortune to bring back the firearms program, the program that I taught in, but I think it should be done in a limited basis. 
Uh, our vocational program should be restored. We know it's not going to be in the same format, but we will bring them back. Um, the difference between us and them has to change. It should be all of us. Uh, eight, do you feel you have adequate knowledge about the collective bargaining process and employee rights? And uh, do you support it? Can you please explain? Uh, based upon my background, serving with numerous major community organizations, uh, the American Red Cross, on a statewide basis, uh, the uh, Los Angeles Regional Food Bank, as the only law enforcement officer ever appointed to that board, as a president and uh, uh, as a chair, vice chair and board member of the credit union, as a former city council member, and as a mayor of a major city, <laughs> no, I have the background to uh, and knowledge about collective bargaining and employees' rights. When I first came here my very first semester, uh, there was a walkout uh, to get better wages and benefits for the employees. And I walked out with uh, several of my employees, fellow workers that I worked with, and uh, they said, you don't have to do this because this is your first year. And I said, well, I'm going to get the same benefits you get, and we all have to sacrifice together. And so I was out on the picket line multiple times. Now, one of the things, the question that I asked at the time that I noticed was that a number of fellow employees didn't go out on the picket line. And that was disturbing because coming from a law enforcement background, the union is everything. If you don't follow the union dictates, particularly in bargaining, and you're going to receive the same benefits, you pay a penalty down the road. And one of the things that all of our employees have to look at this together, we're all in the same boat. And if one of us wishes to ride on the back of someone else to get the same benefits, you may do it. But you'll get less because your strength comes from unity. And that's why this pact is so powerful and so important. And maybe down the road, you may have to walk on the picket line again to get your message out. But it should be done, everyone together in unity. There's strength and unity. And that's why I'm proud to be here to answer the questions to this coalition because there's strength and unity, and we're going to change the name to this board, which has been a board of cronyism for the past 12 years. There's going to be some changes coming out. So, I'm ready for that job. I understand the collective bargaining process, and I stressed when I first started this interview uh, in my first question that fairness and trust will be two items that you will uh, find and have come from me. Um, what is your understanding of the AB 1725 in shared governance? Do you think commercially is consulted uh, should be extended to classified uh, staff? Okay, yeah. Uh, AB 1725, when it was signed in 1987 by Governor George Dumation, was designed to give faculty and, and, and staff, uh, particularly more geared towards faculty, input into uh, the programs that are here at each college. But there was one weakness built into the system, was that it allowed each college to implement AB 725 uh, geared towards that college. And one of the things that we found out here at Lonely City College is that we may have some input, but it can just be cut off and the administration will decide to do what it wants to do on its own. So that's the downfall that we have. Now, some information about uh, uh, AB 7, uh, 1725 is that the benefits that the California State Legislature 
uh, design for us to have this was that it would give bring more expertise into the process of running the college. It would have more people have a greater understanding of the objectives and decisions made here at the college. It would give us more of a commitment to implement this on a fair basis. It would also guarantee more leadership opportunities for those in the faculty, the staff, and adjunct faculty. And also, AB 1725 was, to a lesser degree, designed to include student input, as well as giving us an opportunity for a conflict resolution, cause less dissent on the campuses, and make the campuses more transparent. Now, uh, there's 11 major uh, classifications that the uh, AB 1725 was uh, designed to address. And uh, I have it here for me. I'm going to share it with you so you can say, hey, well, this guy does know what he's talking about. <laughs> uh, we have input into the curriculum at the college, degree and certificate requirements, our grading policies, our educational program development, standards of policies regarding student preparation and success, district and college governance structures as related to faculty roles, faculty roles and involvement in accreditation process, policies for faculty professional development activities, processes for our programs review, processes for institutional planning and budget development, which is key, budget development, and, and last of all, other academic and professional matters as mutually agreed to between the Board of Trustees and the Academic Senate. Uh, when I taught here, I, I, I was a part of shared governance here because I served on the Academic Senate. And I joined it <coughs> Excuse me. because I saw some problems crop up involving some students and I decided that I should become more involved. And I did become more involved. So for the members of the Academic uh, Senate, and as well as to our classified staff and adjunct faculty, and to a lesser degree our students, all of us have a role under AB 1725. But again, the clink in the armor has been, it's up to the college, our board of trustees, to uh, accept our input. And uh, as we found here, that we can make our opinions known but in many cases, they are ignored. So uh, it takes a change in the board uh, to uh, make changes and have a greater input into shared governance. I have number 10. Okay. Would you have the courage and ability to explain and support an unpopular policy? How would you respond to other board of trustees, faculty, students, staff, or administrators who differ in opinion? Well, I like to be open and listen to all opinions. When I worked for the uh, police department, I was a, uh, a troubleshooter uh, for the chief of police. That is, I, had, I was in charge of community relations, and when something went terribly wrong, or was causing uh, problems that were affected negatively on the department, I was sent out to find out what happened, and what could we do to make it right? And so I've learned how to listen to people and to give them their input. And if we were clearly wrong, recommend the changes to the chief, to be honest with the chief, say, hey, this is a problem, we need to change it. And if we were right, to explain our policies. As a member of the city council, uh, when I served, some of my neighbors and friends turned on me because they said, hey, we voted for you to do exactly this. And I said, I can't do this because it would affect uh, in, uh, the majority of our citizens in a negative way. So sometimes you have to accept the input and you have to look at the balances that are out there and in your decisions, no one's, there's gonna be someone that's not happy with every single decision you make. Someone's going to be unhappy. You cannot please everyone. I can make tough decisions. I made tough decisions. And I made them in an honorable way uh, with integrity.
How would you get feedback from your constituents to help inform your vote on important decisions that strongly affect the LBCC community and members of the district you represent? There's different ways of giving feedback. One is you can uh, have surveys. Two, you can have a web page where it says, give me your comments. And three, you can always get comments uh, at your public session, public comment sessions at the Board of Trustees meetings. Uh, I've been at the Board of Trustees meetings for the past year and before that uh, to make sure that I had a very strong foundation when I went to my federal citizens and I came here to the college and said, hey, I wish to represent you and be a representative on the Board of Trustees. And someone said, well, where have you been for the past year? I said, I've been here. I've been here more than many of the members who are being paid full time. I understand your issues. And one of the things that distressed me that I saw when I saw the lack of trust and the lack of respect uh, to our students and our staff was I was attending one meeting and I witnessed a high level administrator, and I didn't know who he was at the time, a sort of student. I was only three feet away from the student and the person nearly ran me over in the process uh, to uh, assault the student, which he did. There was a police officer uh, standing within feet of it that saw the whole thing. The officer came and separated the two and I said, officer, this gentleman here assaulted this young man over here. And to my dismay, uh, it was ignored by the officer. It was ignored by a second officer. It was ignored by the supervisor at the scene. Nobody wanted to take a report because the assaulter was a high level member of the administration. And I was shocked I had never run into anything like that in my 30 years of law enforcement. And I forced them to take a statement for, from me indicating that I was the witness and I saw what happened and that there should have been an arrest made at the scene. Well, of course, no arrest was made. And uh, after that, and I spent some time trying to force uh, the report to be made. Uh, forced the officer to take a report from the uh, student that had been assaulted. They didn't want to do any of this, and I said, something is amiss here. Our law enforcement on the campus has to be neutral. It cannot take sides, administrators versus staff, administrators versus faculty, administrators versus adjunct faculty or classified staff. That can't be. You have to be neutral across the line for fairness and for trust in the system. It was apparent that that didn't exist at the time. So one of the issues that I definitely would address when I'm a member of the Board of Trustees is that our law enforcement here on the campus will be neutral. It will be not, if I commit a crime, arrest me, all right? Don't give me any breaks. If I decide I want to assault, I'm not going to assault anyone, I promise you. But if I'm assaulting someone and I'm wrong, then arrest me. Don't cover up for me. That's one of the issues that are here at this campus. So I would definitely change that. Describe your campaign organization, plan, message, community support, community sources of funding, and amount raised to date. How do you assess your chances of I think my chances are going to be pretty good. I, uh, more than likely, I will not be running against an incumbent. It'll be an open seat. All right. And if I run against the, if the incumbent uh, does run again, uh, there's enough ammunition out there to make a hard-hitting attack against decisions that the incumbent made. And we'll look at this issue of so the executive perks. We'll look at this issue of that part-time board members have lifetime free medical for themselves and their family. That wasn't in the package when he ran for the office. So if the incumbent is there, uh, there, there are definitely issues to forcibly attack the incumbent. Uh, for if it's an open race, then the, stat the change would be more emphasis on this is what I'm bringing to the community and to the college. 
I have a core group of, of campaign supporters that will back me in the campaign. And then I'm going to have a secondary honorary uh, campaign committee uh, of, of major people in strategic spots throughout the district to make sure that we get the votes out in districts across the entire spectrum of District 5, which includes not only the city of Lakewood, but also the city of Long Beach. Uh, the funding will be in place. In the past, uh, the incumbent has always put $10,000 of his own money into his campaign to kickstart it. I already told many people before, that's not a problem. I'll put $10,000 into my campaign to kickstart it. And then once uh, the campaign is under uh, running, the fundraising letters will go out. And I'm, I'm pretty sure with the friends I have, family members I have, uh, that that campaign budget uh, funding will go up dramatically from there. Uh, the campaign in the past for District 5, uh, they've spent no more in the, in the 2010 election. Uh, they spent, uh, the incumbent spent probably $15,000. I pulled the paperwork and took a look at it. Uh, that would include, uh, on his behalf, two mailers out of his own personal campaign. And in this case, if you have a very powerful pack, that would take some of that burden off with their mailers. But uh, the outreach is there. So the money is going to be there. The money is already committed and will be there. Uh, the key, my campaign manager has managed several campaigns in this area in the past, and he's won. And uh, we've already taken some major steps already as identifying locations where we're going to have our campaign signs uh, displayed, which will come out after January. Because we have a November election coming up first, which is going to take a lot away from the April 8th election. Uh, note to everybody, 227 days to April 8th. <laughs> so there's a countdown period. And there's work that's going to be done behind the scenes uh, for that. Also, uh, when, uh, when the PAC endorsement is made, then you'll be able to add to it. Two other major organizations have already endorsed me. And a third major organization, uh, once the endorsement, PAC endorsement is made, uh, I will sit with down with them and get that third major endorsement. Um, and I assure you that there are major endorsements to add to the PAC endorsement. So the campaign started well before January. It actually started on January 1. I uh, started to get things lined up, speaking to different people, looking at what my website is pending, and uh, the uh, treasurer, uh, the financial committee has already been set. We already have our FPC C number. We already have that. So the key parts of the uh, campaign have already been set up. The only thing we have to wait for is when the filing date is going to be set, uh, Los Angeles County, uh, voter Register Office has not set the filing date because they're more concerned with the November election. They'll probably set that date or announce it sometime in October or November. The last filing date I do know is March 24th of 2014. And so the campaign will be well in swing by then, even though I assume, and you have to count on the fact that after the November election, there's always going to be someone that lost a run out there that's going to look around and say, what can I do to stay in the public eye? And they'll look at the uh, Board of Trustees race. But by that time, our campaign should be in full swing and with the uh, strong support of all three major employee groups on the campus, um, a person would have to take a hard look at running against something like that. If I do my part and you do your part, you'll have that second vote on the board on April 8th with the election victory on April 8th. 2014.